Our speaker tonight, um, Mariska Kreik, grew up in the Netherlands and obtained both her master's in science and her PhD in astronomy from Leiden University. After completing her PhD, she was an H.N. Russell postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Astrophysics Science at Princeton University and a Clay postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. She joined the faculty of Berkeley in, the, uh, in January of 2012, where she is currently, including just like two hours ago, involved in large observing programs that supports her area of research. Um, galaxies are the building blocks of the universe, and they contain up to hundreds of billions of stars. In today's universe, galaxies show striking diversity among their properties, both in their appearance, size, age, weight, and so forth. They can broadly be divided into two types, low mass spirals and old elliptical galaxies. It has remained a puzzle how this dichotomy originated and how the different galaxy classes are, may be related to each other. Tonight our speaker will discuss this issue and prevent, present the current views of how these different types of galaxies may have been formed and evolved over time. Join me in welcoming Mariska Pryde. recent uh, research that I've been working on in the last uh, couple of years, and I want to start with this picture that you see on the screen here. And you may wonder what it is. This is actually, this is not real, right? This is an artist's view. And this is an image that we used for a press release a couple of years ago, and just to illustrate how the universe may look like if you would live on a planet when the universe was still very young in a particular type of galaxy. Okay, keep that in mind. It's going to be clear throughout the talk why it looks like this, and then we'll come back to this. So this is not how our sky looks like, right? Our sky is a little bit more dark. <laughs> but before we go to this, and before we go to galaxies, let's first try and get an idea of like what the scale is that we're talking about here, right? Like how big are galaxies actually? Okay, so we all know about this object, right? Earth. We think Earth is really big, right? <laughs> it takes a long time to go from one to the other side. But our Earth is very, very tiny compared to our Sun. So if you compare Earth to the Sun, it's like a factor of 100 difference, right? So here you see a little dot. That's the Earth. And here's this really nice, beautiful image of the Sun. But you know, our Sun is only one of the hundreds of billions of stars in our Milky Way. And there's so many stars in our Milky Way, and our sun is actually really, really tiny compared to our Milky Way. So if you just want to compare that, it would be something like this. And you don't even see it anymore. So how big is our Milky Way? You can sort of make the comparison of a football compared to the sun. That's our sun compared to the Milky Way. A football compared to the sun, it's like nothing. So that's how tiny our sun is compared to our Milky Way. And there's so many stars in our Milky Way, and the sun is just one of them, and our sun is somewhere here. So here you see a picture of the Milky Way that we're living in. It looks pretty nice. It's a beautiful galaxy. There's lots of stuff going on. You know, the Milky Way has these spiral arms. There's this sort of reddish kind of over, like, more dense piece in the center. But this is not a real photo. Milky Way, right? <laughs> because we cannot really take a photo of our Milky Way. We can actually can take a photo of the Milky Way, but we can unfortunately not take a photo of the Milky Way from the outside. So this is how we think our Milky Way looks like. But that's what we think. We don't actually really know it exactly. So here you see a picture of how we think our Milky Way, that we actually can observe from our Milky Way. So this is a real picture. And so we're somewhere on the side, and here you see the center of the Milky Way. You see the Magellanic Clouds. And um, so yeah, this is the center. This is more the outskirts. But in order to take this photo of the Milky Way, you cannot just look up and take a photo. Now, this photo is taken by taking photos over the whole sky from all the pieces of the Earth. So it's actually done with a satellite that's in orbit around the Earth. And then put it all together, so it's basically an all-sky photo. An all-sky photo, and then you can see our Milky Way. Because you can never, 
with just one piece or one shot get the whole Milky Way on the, on the picture. And this is not what we're going to see from here. If you really want to see the center of the Milky Way, you have to go to the Southern Hemisphere, as probably a lot of you have seen. So if you're in the Southern Hemisphere, and especially if you go to a place where it's pretty dark, and you look up, you can really nicely see the Milky Way over the sky and the Magellanic Clouds. You do see there are some kind of dark, patchy structures here, so you don't really see through it all the way, and that's all dust. So the dust is basically blocking sort of the view of what we have of the Milky Way. So our Milky Way is just one of the many, many billions of galaxies out there. Our Milky Way is just one of the galaxies. And our Milky Way is actually kind of a typical galaxy. And as you could see in that one photo that I showed, the Milky Way has these spiral arms. And so the Milky Way actually looks kind of similar as our close neighbor, the Andromeda Nebula. So all of you who have a Mac know this picture really well. It's the background of the Mac. <laughs> and you see how beautiful it is. So our, our own <coughs> galaxy, our Milky Way, looks a little bit like this. And you see, on one hand, our spiral arms are sort of harder to see because this is kind of edge on. Uh, you see also, again, this piece in the center where it's more um, like thickening, like thick or more bright, and it's a little more, bit redder. And you see like these dusty structures over here, these dark patches, which is all dust that's blocking the view. So it turns out actually half, yes? I was wondering, all those stars in the foreground? Stars yeah. Yes. So usually, yeah, most of the stars you're seeing will be foreground stars. Yeah. But not all the things that you're seeing here are actually stars. Some of these things are galaxies, like these are galaxies, these are galaxies, mm -hmm. this is a galaxy. So uh, lots of the things you see are actually galaxies as well. But yeah, if you see a star, it's usually uh, it's a foreground star. Sorry? Unless it's a seed that... Yeah. Do I know about this? Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so usually if you see a star in another galaxy, it has to be really, really bright. Uh, so it turns out that spiral galaxies are actually kind of common. And almost half of the galaxies, or about half of the galaxies in the universe are spiral galaxies. So here you see another few spiral galaxies. So these are all pictures, almost all of them from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's still one of our best telescopes around that can make very high resolution imaging. And you see lots of you see lots of things they have in common, but also some differences. So the first thing they all have in common is that they're disks. So they're flat. And that means the stars are rotating in them. So the stars don't stay at the same spot, they're actually rotating. So for example, our sun is rotating around the center of the Milky Way with about 220 kilometers a second. I'm from Europe, so I cannot really <laughs> translate that to miles. We're out, but maybe some of you can. <laughs> um, so yeah, so they all have this, this, this uh, thing in the center, which we call a ball. Some of them have more like a bar-like structure. It's more like elongated. We call it a bar. So you see the big spiral arms. So this is what we call a grand design spiral. This is more like a multi-arm spiral. So the other thing they all have in common is that they're all bluish. So how do they? How are they bluish? Well, that's because yes. What's the, is there a simple explanation of what's going on in the upper right hand corner there with that dark? That's dust again. Yeah, that's but dust. I've that's never seen it. that's dust that's really blocking the view of the light. It's the same if you have dust on Earth. If you have a lot of dust. Then yeah. you can really like obscure it, so the light cannot get through it. it doesn't mean there's nothing behind it. Um, yeah. It's so it's all over on one side, like that. That's because that's the far side. So the far side is more obscure because the light has to travel more through the dust. You see. Yeah. So the other thing that I have in common, as I said, is that they're all kind of bluish, and they're bluish because that's the kind of stars that are living in these galaxies. So how does this work? Well, if you see that galaxies are blue, that usually means that the stars are pretty young. So stars are around for, for a certain amount of time, and the very massive, the very bluish stars are only around for a very, very short time. So if you see that a galaxy is blue, that means that that very 
massive stars that only live very shortly are still around, and that means that the galaxy is probably still pretty young. So the light is telling us how old the stars are. So if you see red light from a galaxy, that means that the stars are much older. So the most massive stars have already died out into supernova. And if you see red, yeah, if you see blue light, that means that there are still younger, very massive stars in these galaxies. So yeah, these are things that have in common. They're blue, they're disky, the stars are going uh, around the center. Um, they have spiral arms. And this is about half of the galaxies <coughs> in, the middle, in our universe. The other half are galaxies that we call elliptical galaxies. And here you see an image in which they're really nicely put together. So I didn't put them together. They actually are neighbors in the sky, these two galaxies. So this is really one image, uh, one photo of these two neighbors together. So this is a star. You see that you can recognize the star by the refraction specs. And here. And you immediately see kind of a difference between the two, right? So this one is blue, this one is red. So you can immediately see this one must be older. The stars are older because it's a redder galaxy. The other thing is you don't see spiral arms. It's actually also not a disk. It's not a disk galaxy. It's rounder. It's an elliptical shape. It means it has three dimensions. And the stars don't rotate. No, the stars go all around, like in a sort of a gas. Like they're all moving in all kind of random directions. And that's what's supporting the gravity, and that's why it's not collapsing. So here is probably the most famous elliptical galaxy. So a lot of you may have heard of this. This is M87. And this is, again, a really nice uh, photo. I'm not actually sure if it's from the Hubble Space Telescope, but it looks uh, really nice. So this is a huge, huge use. This has not hundreds of billions of stars, but this one has thousands of billions of stars in it. And here you can also better see that it's, it's kind of roundish, and it's not actually a disk. It's not flattened. It doesn't only have two dimensions. No, it's like really 3D. So whatever side you would see it, you would never see it as a disk. And here you see another couple of those elliptical galaxies. So some of them have sort of like this kind of disky thing in them. And again, you see the light is blocked, so it's again dust. That's blocking the light. And here as well. But yeah, you see that they look pretty similar. If you wouldn't look at that like dusty disk that's in there, they look pretty similar. They're all red, they have old stars, actually kind of boring. They're sort of, yeah, boring, red, big systems. Um, yes. The, the dust, is it truly like particle dust or is the dust really actually boulder size? But it's so big. It's it's like really dust, they're dust grains. Oh, they are grains. Okay. Yeah, they're tiny little dust grains. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, there's lots of dust in our uh, galaxy and in other galaxies. Okay, so this dichotomy of, on one hand, elliptical galaxies and this galaxies is not new. We've known this for a very, very long time. And one of the people who first recognized this or tried to understand this and tried to classify it was Edwin Hubble. And he came up with this Hubble tuning fork. Okay. And he said you can basically divide galaxies into two types. On one hand, the ellipticals, and on the other hand, the spiral galaxies. And within the elliptical galaxies, it depends like what their ellipticity is, so how flattened are they. So if they're completely round, they're completely on this side. If they're more, if the ellipticity is higher, then they're more on this side. And then here are the spirals. And there's also kind of a sequence in there, and the sequence is sort of set by how much light is there in the center. So how much light is there in the bulge, as we call that, and how much light is there in the disk. And then there's this difference whether they actually have a bar here, or whether they just have a round center, whether they have a bar-shaped bar center or a round <coughs> center. So if you look at this, you would think, well, you know, this is all pretty well behaved. It should be pretty easy to explain what's causing this, right? And that actually has been pretty difficult. So originally, when this sequence was invented, people thought that galaxies move from this side to that side. So they start off as being an elliptical galaxy, and then they later on grow a disk, and then they become a disk galaxy. But there are some issues with that. First, if you go into this direction, the galaxies actually become older and redder. Mm -hmm. So how do you put that together, right? It doesn't really fit. They become rounder. That's another issue. They become heavier. 
So they're much heavier this side. So these galaxies, these elliptical galaxies, have hundreds to thousands of billions of stars, while these ones are actually lighter. And you cannot make something that's really heavy into something that's really light, right? It's not going to work. So another difference, maybe some clues, is in what kind of environments are these galaxies living? So our Milky Way and Andromeda Nebula live in a pretty sparse piece of the universe. There's not that much going on here. We call it the local group. We have some little neighbors, as you can see over here. So there's a triangulum, this M33. So here's our Milky Way, that's Andromeda. You see that Andromeda is a little bigger. And our Milky Way has a lot of tiny little thingies around it, like Magellanic Clouds and other very uh, low mass dwarf galaxies, as you would call them, and the same with Andromeda. And you see that these both are spiral galaxies. But then if I look at an environment of an elliptical galaxy, you get something like this. So this is a very cool image from Hubble again, in which you can really see the gravitational lensing effect here. So this is such a huge, huge, big, massive uh, group of galaxies together that is actually bending the light and causing these arcs. But that's a topic for a different story. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you can see that the environment of on one hand the ellipticals and the other hand the disk galaxies is really different. And that the disk galaxies really, or the spiral galaxies, really like to live or live in like under dense environments, environments where they don't have a lot of neighbors, while the elliptical galaxies live in environments where there's lots of neighbors and it's very dense. So that's another piece of information that we're having here. So this is more crowded areas. So these are more massive, they live in more crowded areas, they have older stars in them, and they, um, they are more rounder. Well, and they don't have any kind of rotations of the stars. The stars just move all the way around. Well, these ones are un live in like under dense environment and very sparse environments. They're, ha they're much lower in weight and in mass, and they're much bluer, they're younger, and uh, yeah, they're rotating. So then my question is, how did both these populations form? Where did they come from? And maybe even more important, are they connected to each other? Or are they really just completely different populations? Do these galaxies, <coughs> the spirals just appear and evolve and the elliptical galaxies and they just have nothing to do with each other? Well, that's something that we like to understand. So there's some, several ways how you can try to understand how galaxies work. And one way is just looking at these galaxies around us and trying to dissect them. So try to understand what kind of stars live in them, what are these stars doing, what different components. Oh, the center maybe looks a little bit more redder, so maybe it's older. And really try to understand what's going on. So lots of people do that, and we call that sort of uh, more like fossil studies or archaeology. On the other hand, astronomers are actually kind of lucky because we are probably the only science that can look back in time and really see how the universe looked like at a different time. So we can actually see the history. We don't have to infer the history, now we can see the history. Okay. Because as we know, uh, galaxies do have a lifetime of about, well this galaxy is definitely not done, it'll probably be around for a much longer time, about five billion years. Well, people only have about a lifetime of about 80 years. So within our own lives, we're not going to see a galaxy change. So just by looking at the galaxy itself, we're not going to see it evolve. The only thing we may be able to see is a supernova going off. Because that's the only thing that actually has the time scale that you can actually see. But all the other stuff that's happening, like that happens over such longer time periods that we're never going to see it. But as I said, we're lucky, and we can look back in the history of the universe. And that's already apparent if we look back, for example, at the sun. And this is all possible because the light <coughs> takes a certain time to travel. So the speed of light is finite, which means that the light will take some time to reach us. So the light that comes from the sun takes eight light minutes, eight minutes to reach us. So if we look at the sun, we see the sun how it was eight minutes ago. If you look at the closest star, we don't see the star right, right now, we see the star when it was four years ago. If you look at Andromeda, we don't really know how Andromeda <coughs> looks like at this moment. We only know how Andromeda looked like 2.4 million years ago. 
And then we can even look back all the way to almost the Big Bang. So this is the cosmic microwave background. This is the afterglow of the Big Bang. So this is still radiation, still light from the Big Bang that took 13.7 billion years to reach us. So that light has been traveling 13.7 billion years before it caught our eye or our telescope. I see a question. Um, the galaxy, the Mm -hmm. um, so, are you saying it's not there anymore? It's definitely still there, yeah. But it may not look like this anymore. So it may actually have, it may look a little different at this moment. Maybe something happens, maybe some stars die, and maybe some new stars formed. And maybe there are these tiny little things that like move towards it, for example. So we just don't know how it looks like at this moment. We only know how it looked like. 2.4 million light years ago. And that's the interesting thing, right? We can look back in the history of the universe, so we can see how the universe looked like at an early point, but we can only see each galaxy at one point in time. Only at one point. We can never see galaxies at several points. So that's one thing to keep in mind. So you can see how the universe evolved, you cannot see how one galaxy evolves. So you have to be clever and thinking like how do you match this up. So as I said, you can look back as far as about 13.7 or 13.6 billion years back in time, and here you see sort of the history of the universe, this uh, very nice image. So our universe is about 13.7 billion years old. This is where we are. This is where this cosmic microwave background was. Here is the Big Bang. And you can see galaxies all the way down here. So Andromeda is somewhere here, but we can see as far back as about here. So we can really poke back in the history of time just because the speed of light is finite. Okay, so that helps us. There's another thing that actually complicates it a little bit. And that is that our universe is not static. Our universe is expanding. So what does that mean? That means that everything is moving away from each other. Not everything, like we are not moving away from each other, our Earth stays together, our galaxies stay together, because they are pulled back together by gravity. <coughs> but if you go to longer scales, the gravity doesn't hold it together anymore, there's another force, that's what we call dark energy, that's making the universe expand and expand. So you can basically compare it with sort of a balloon in which you put coins on, and then you blow it up. And all these coins, they move away from each other, but the coins itself stay about the same size, but the distance between them gets bigger. So for example, Andromeda, that's close enough that we still are attached to each other by our gravity. But other galaxies are so far away that they will actually move away from us and away from us and away from us. Which means that the universe also gets darker and darker and darker over time. And this is not only for the distance between them, but it's also true for the light. Okay, so this is a little complicated, but this basically tells us that because galaxies are moving away from each other, because everything is moving away from each other, that the light is also gonna be sort of altered. So how does this work? So all the light we're see are seeing are photons, and every photon has a certain wavelength, as you can see over here. But if an object is moving away from us, that wavelength will be extracted. If the object would move towards us, it will be condensed. <coughs> so this is what we call redshift, and this is what we call blue shift. So this is sort of this is like a Doppler shift. So you can you probably know about the example with a train. If a train is approaching you or if it's going away from you, it has you hear it with a different sort of frequency. It makes a different kind of noise. It's a higher or lower noise. So that's the same effect as here. So galaxies that are moving away from us, their light that we're seeing, it looks actually a little redder than the light that they sent to us. So while it was traveling, the universe was expanding, and the light that we receive is redder. Okay. So what are the implications for that? Well, this, this becomes a little complicated, but this is sort of the light distribution of a typical galaxy. Okay, so what are we looking at? This is wavelength. This is the brightness, so how bright is it? And this is where our eye is sensitive. So this is our rainbow. 
So we can see this part of this light distribution of this galaxy. So this galaxy would look a little bit bluer because it's brighter at bluer wavelengths than it is at redder wavelengths, but it's pretty flat, so it probably mainly looks a little yellowish. But this galaxy is now in the universe today. But what if this galaxy is not in the universe today, but this galaxy is actually 11 billion years away from us? Okay, what happens then? Well, this is going to shift. So we're going to change this x-axis, and we're going to extend it to longer wavelengths, and just follow this piece. So this will stay the same. So that rainbow but that, that's over here is now over here, and you see that the units on this axis have changed. So you see this one goes from 2,000 to 7,000, and here you see that 2,000 from 7,000 is now about here. So this is the optical light from our eye, but because this light has traveled so long to reach us, by the time it reaches the Earth, it's not optical light anymore. So it was admitted as optical light, as light that we could see with our eye, but by the time it reaches the Earth, it's about 1 to 2 micron. So what are we talking about then? Well, that's near infrared wavelengths. That's heat radiation. So it's emitted at light that we, our eyes can see, but we have to observe it in the infrared in order to see it. So this light is what we call redshift. So what are the implications for this? Well, if you want to understand, if you want to study galaxies, when the universe was much younger today, we shouldn't look at optical wavelengths, at the wavelengths that our eyes are sensitive to, or visible wavelengths. No, we need to go to infrared wavelengths, because that's how we can study galaxies in the early universe. And that is exactly what Hubble does. So Hubble is sensitive to this part as well, but Hubble is also very sensitive here. So most telescopes, so not only Hubble, but also the big Keck telescopes and the Y and other telescopes, the big optical telescopes, always have some near infrared capabilities as well, because that's really important. It's also important to actually look through the, through the dust that we saw earlier, but that's a different topic. Yes? Is near infrared such a, you know, uh, as in the scale, uh, three or four times the wavelengths of visible light? Yeah, so if you would see it in, in log scale, not so much, but in linear scale, like near infrared goes about from where our eye stops being sensitive, so maybe like 7,000, all the way to 2.5 micron, I would say, is near infrared. And then you start getting to the mid infrared regime and the far infrared. But that's a good point. So our eyes are sensitive in only a tiny little piece of the electromagnetic spectrum, because the electromagnetic spectrum, so all the light, all the energy there is, goes all the way from X ray radiation to all the way to radio waves, x-ray waves to radio waves. And that's like many, 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 many orders of magnitude difference, and our eyes are only sensitive to a tiny little piece. So we're already pretty lucky that stars are actually also shining at these wavelengths, so we can actually learn something. Right? We would evolve, evolve. We would evolve. Yeah, yeah so exactly. This is, this is the best wavelength to be sensitive to, apparently. Although not, yeah, anyway, different topic. <laughs> let's, let's talk about this image. So I said that we want to look back in time, and we have to go to near infrared wavelength to do this. So this is the deepest image, the deepest photo that's ever been taken of the sky. This is the Hubble, Hubble Ultra Deep Field. It doesn't actually look that impressive here, but if you would zoom in, all these things are galaxies. So the remarkable thing is there's actually only two stars four grand stars in this whole image. You see one here? Yep. And there must be another one. But yeah, these are all these little blobby things that you see. They're all galaxies at different moments in time. And this is not a photo that the Hubble just said, click down. No, this took weeks, 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 weeks. And the camera was just open and was just collecting the light. Because if you only look at it for an hour, you're not going to see anything of this. You have to collect the light for, for weeks. And then you get an image like that. So this is the Hubble Space Telescope, as you all know. And here you can actually see, zoom in, how tiny, tiny little piece of the sky the Hubble Ultra Deep Field actually is. OK, so let's start with a big piece of the sky that we all know. And here you see where that piece of the sky actually is. And then you zoom in. And you zoom in further and further. 
and right. even much further. <laughs> so this piece of the sky is kind of randomly chosen, so there's no reason why we choose this piece, except for that there are no programmed stars, because we don't like programmed stars. And here you see it fly through. So you see all these galaxies are actually at different points in time. So some of these galaxies will be rather nearby, they will only be like one billion years away, other will be two billion years away, other will be three. And so you have galaxies at all different points, and here you're really flying through. And then you see these very, very distant, very red things that you just saw go by. Oh. <laughs> I didn't make that. That's the credit. Okay, so I started off with... I have a question. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, they have, uh, I believe that, uh, if, not, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when we were to look at uh, very distant galaxies with, uh, with very high redshifts, uh, the galaxies would not necessarily appear redder. Is that right? Because even though the, sp the spectrum has shifted uh, toward the red, yeah. uh, what we're seeing is the, um, the violet or ultraviolet coming into view uh, because that would be stretched into the visual range. Yes. Yeah, so so you, that yeah. the, the galaxies would not appear, would not therefore appear redder. Is so you right? actually have a really good point, and that uh, actually fits in my story really nicely. So galaxies in the early universe, probably lots of them had much higher uh, stellar birth rates, so they were making many more stars. And as I told you before, if you're making stars, if you have young stars, you're going to be very blue. And you're also going to shine at the UV. So galaxies in the early universe, we thought early on that they would probably all be very blue. So even if you would redshift them, the UV would be shifted to the optical, and so they would actually still look pretty bright, even at optical wavelengths. So yeah, that's a good point. But that's what we thought initially. But then we want to understand like how these elliptical galaxies have formed, how these spiral galaxies have formed, and it turns out that the elliptical galaxies actually already existed when the universe was only about two to four billion years old. And for these galaxies, that's not the case. So it's true for very, very bright galaxies with lots of stars that are being formed. So it would be true for spiral galaxies very early in the universe, that if you shift them, you could still sort of see them at optical wavelengths. None of them are like only 0.5 billion years after Big Bang, then they're definitely not visible anymore, but yeah. So one of the things we found is that elliptical galaxies already existed when the universe was only 3 billion years old. So this is actually kind of striking because you would think that all these elliptical galaxies, they have lots of stars, right? They must have formed their stars at some point. The stars didn't just appear, like all these galaxies have formed at some point. The stars have formed at some point. But these elliptical galaxies already existed when the universe was very young. Here you see a couple of examples of how elliptical galaxies look like. They're pretty tiny, right? The resolution is unfortunately not as good as in the local universe. But you see, they're little tiny little blobbies, and they're red. They have no, they, they have no very young, massive stars anymore. So they have already older stars that are already very reddish. But the interesting thing about these elliptical galaxies in the early universe it's not so much, on one hand that we found them, but the other interesting thing is that they're actually super compact. They're super dense. The stars are so close to each other that they pack the amount of mass that we pack in a super big galaxy in a tiny, tiny little galaxy. For example, if you would compare such an ultra-compact galaxy to the Milky Way, you put all the stars of the Milky Way in this little piece, and that's how dense it would be. So they're actually quite different from the elliptical galaxies today. Mm. And that's why I said initially, if you would live in such a compact galaxy in the early universe and you look up at the sky, you see that the sky is pretty much filled with stars because wow. this galaxy is so dense, there are so many stars in the galaxy and the stars are so mm. nearby each other <coughs> that the sky would be almost completely filled so it doesn't really get dark that much at night. Wow. It's the galaxy was formed, as some are saying now, by a black hole initially formed the galaxy instead of a condensing cloud of dust that coalesced into stars. Uh, would that be an explanation for the density 
these so, ellipticals? All the, so these ellipticals are most likely going to have black holes, and the black holes, uh, so almost every galaxy is going to have a black hole in the center, a supermassive black hole. Um, and we think that the, the black hole may have played an important role, but it didn't actually yeah, form the galaxy. But it could be that the first stars are so massive that they collapse in itself, form a black hole, and that's sort of, and, that, and in the meantime, the galaxy also starts forming there. But yeah. So are you, you're, have you been aware of the, the theory that's going around now that they're saying that um, one possibility is that galaxies have actually, the black holes have actually formed First, the galaxy? And you, yeah, so I don't actually think that's true. I think they're probably formed, it's not that the black hole forms it, but if you, the galaxy needs to be formed at some point, and so once you start forming your first stars, that's when you form a galaxy, and the first stars may have been very massive, and if a very massive star, like if a supernova is very massive, it actually eventually becomes a black hole. So I think it's more like a sort of a thing that happens at the same time. Okay. Yeah, I don't think it's because there's a black hole, that's why the galaxy forms. But um, that's an interesting theory, yeah. Huh. Well, it's gaining strength. Um, yeah. Well, I think they're, they go together, right? They're both important because that's where the gravity is highest. Like in, yeah. Okay, so what is this picture now? Well, oh, yes. Uh, given that our nearest star is just about four light years from us, how far apart would stars be in a galaxy like that? That's a really good question. I think the density can be as high, high as like a factor of a thousand higher. So then in one direction it would be a factor of 10. So then it would probably be 0.4 light years. But that's just like a calculation I'm making very quickly. But if they, were, if they were that close, would there be any danger of them like, gravitational no, tug on each other and pulling gas? No, because they don't, stars don't collide. They don't. Um, okay, so it would be far enough away, stars would be far enough away that they would be <coughs> gravitational. Yeah, because the gravity. distance between the two stars is still going to be so much bigger than the star itself. So, yeah. <coughs> but they may be caught in each other's orbits. So you can get more double stars. That's definitely what could happen. But yeah, a double star, like usually if two stars uh, will approach each other, they won't collide. They will just like catch each other and then go rotating around each other. That's what will happen. So this is not a picture we're having, right? So we have the Big Bang. We have the early universe, about three billion years, from two to five, four. We find all these really compact nuggets, we call them. And then they become bigger over time and bigger over time. And so you may wonder, yeah, that's not that weird, right? You just add some, you just form some new stars. Why don't you just form new stars, right? And then you make them bigger. But these are elliptical galaxies. Elliptical galaxies don't make stars anymore. They're dumb. They're dead. We call them red and dead galaxies. And so what's happening here? And the masses don't barely change. They still have about the same mass. So they're really puffing up. And really, the first time we found this, like this was only like a couple of years ago, we were really puzzled. Initially, most astronomers said that, no, that's completely ridiculous. That cannot be true. That cannot be true. What's going on here? So, question. How do distant compact galaxies grow in size? Collisions. Exactly. <laughs> but it's not just collisions between two big ones, because if you collide two things that are really big, you're still going to get such a compact thing. So you need something else. So we actually know that we don't live in a universe in which a galaxy forms and just stays. Now, our universe is becoming more structured and structured over time. So little things come together and form bigger things and form bigger things and form bigger things. And here is what you see what we call a merger halo tree or merger tree. So basically, time goes in this direction. And here you start off with little things. And these little things, here you see two little things merge to something bigger. And then this thing merges with this one. And eventually, you end up with something that's really big. So this is what we call a merger tree. So this sounds a little cryptic, maybe. So you could probably better see it in this simulation, where you can really nicely see how the universe is forming bigger structures over time and over time and over time. And we do know these things happen. But as I said, we don't need mergers or collisions of two galaxies that have the same size. What we really need is collisions with things that are tinier. And here you can sort of see that that's actually really happening. 
that you see collect tiny things falling in. You see these tidal tills here. And so these images have been taken by also keeping your camera of your telescope open for a very, very long time. Because if you would just like take photos of about an hour, you would never see these features here. You really have to keep the camera open for a very long time. Yes? What's the redshift or look back time on these events? Uh, this is this is pretty nearby, maybe only long or something. Yeah. Yeah, so these are actually nearby galaxies, but you see that nearby galaxies still to seem to build up their outskirts. Yes. Is it spirals merging that are forming these ultra compact ellipticals? The origin of the ultra compact ellipticals, we're going to get that to back there. Yeah, I promise, I'll get back to there. So this moment, we're more trying to understand like how they how they actually grow. And the origin is the next question. It's a good question. So what's going on? If you actually really compare the light profiles, so the light distribution in these galaxies, it looks like something like this. So you have density profile here, or light profile, mass profile, whatever you want to call it. And here you have the radius, so far, how far out you go. And these distant elliptical galaxies look something like this. And then the today's ellipticals look something like this. Well, this is actually in a large scale. I should have put it in a linear scale. But the idea is that the centers are pretty much the same density. And the difference is really here. So what this tells us is that galaxies are building inside out. They're really building inside out. They're building their outskirts later on. And they do that, indeed, by collisions. They do that by collisions with tiny video galaxies. But then I have to be honest, and I was at a conference just like a month ago, and there's people who still don't believe this theory, and I think that there's other explanations how you can do it. So this is definitely not an answer question. This is still something that keeps lots of astronomers busy in this world. How do these complex elliptical galaxies grow? But yeah, we know that there are mergers, and we know that there are tiny little mergers, and probably all the material from these tiny little collisions is dumped in the outskirts, which is really making the galaxies look bigger, and it's not actually adding that much mass. It's just making them fuzzy at the outside. So then, if you go back to this picture, it means that these little nuggets that you see over here, they're just the cores of the big things that you see over there. They're just the cores, they're the centers. And they're growing inside out over time. Yes? So, um, wouldn't you then see a difference, you know, over time in the numbers? Early on you'd see many more because there's a lot of small ones that haven't been absorbed. And later on they're fewer. Yeah, so people try to do that. They try to play that game in, uh, in matching up the numbers. So these are actually, they're probably, they're more rarer, but if you actually look at the ones that have like very high central density, they actually match up pretty well compared to these ones. So that, that's a very good question. Yeah, so we actually have a paper out about that next week. <laughs> so, um, so the other question is, if we go back, these were just these galaxies over here. So what happens to the elliptical galaxies? Well, we know that elliptical galaxies were compact in early times. But the question that I haven't addressed is where do these complex elliptical galaxies come from, right? Or how are they related to these bigger galaxies over here? So these questions are probably related, right? You would think, maybe? OK, so that's the question. But what about the connection between the spirals and the ellipticals? Right. So, these galaxies, how do they look like when the universe is much younger? Well, they look something like this. They look fuzzy. These are spiral galaxies when the universe was about two to four billion years old. So, with a little bit of imagination, you can see some spiral structure here, right? But one thing that's very apparent is they're very clumpy. They have like these big clumps. And what we think is happening there, we think that these are like the stellar birth sites, the, star, the sites in which the stars are being formed. Maybe these are the the globular clusters in formation, right? The big birth sites within galaxies. But, you know, these are star forming galaxies, and we know that these compact galaxies must have formed their stars at some point. So, maybe these were the progenitors, maybe these were the things that became compact rising galaxies. That's what you would think, right? But then you have like a problem. Because how would you go from something that is so big? something that is so tiny is about similar scale. So, so I, I, I think what you're saying is that this, the one on the left, is, is uh, 
from the early universe. They're both the early universe. Yeah. But but you're it doesn't look like a spiral galaxy. But you're saying it's a oh, this could be spiral R. And this could be it's definitely a disk galaxy. We know from we know it's rotating. We know it's a disk. Oh, you do. Yeah. You can. You, okay. We're measuring. We can measure the rotation in these systems. Oh, you're measuring the rotation. Yeah. But um. Yeah, I understand they don't really look like spirals, and we don't really know whether they're spiral arms because it's really hard to see spiral arms on these distances. Yeah, right. But we do, we do know for sure that most of the spiral, most of the uh, star-forming galaxies are the ones that are still forming these stars, the blue galaxies. But most of them are actually this, that are actually our disks, and that they have rotated. The spirals uh, rotate more than the ellipticals. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's a big difference. So spirals really are rotating; they're flattened; they're disks. And elliptical galaxies are roundish. And they have like 3D. Sorry? Not rotating sometimes. They sometimes have some rotation, but uh, most of, like some of them have no rotations at all. But yeah. Okay. So this is a question, right? Are these two related? And <coughs> so how do we go from spiral galaxies to ellipticals or from star forming to non-star forming? And it, and how would that happen then? And so the other question or the same question is what are actually uh, what is the origin of these things? How do you make them? Well, this is, I'm not going to give you the answer to this question because we don't know this exactly, but I'll give you a couple of theories of what we think may be going on. Okay? So, one theory could be that these clumpy things that you see over here, that these are actually going to migrate to the center and then going to form like a compact thing. So, you see, you start off with something that's big and clumpy and then you get something that's more compact. So this is, what, this is what we call the clump migration scenario. <laughs> so what you see here is, is obviously not observed. This is a simulation. So these people try to simulate. People try to simulate galaxy evolution on the computer. So this is a theory, another very popular theory, which has been around for some time, and I've heard that from one of you, is that you actually may be able to start off with two disk galaxies and merge D together piece together a form of elliptical. For example, something like here. So you start off with two of these disk or spiral galaxies. They have lots of stars in them, and they also still have gas from which the stars are formed. And they're torn apart. And then eventually, they may form an elliptical galaxy. So this is our fate as well. So we, this is what's going to happen to the Milky Way and Andromeda Nebula. We're going to do this too in five billion years. We're going to merge together. Wow. So we know that this happens. The question is, is this the way to make elliptical galaxies? Because how do you make sure that the, star, the stars are not being formed anymore after that? So that's still a big question. So this doesn't really look that much like an elliptical galaxy, maybe. But yeah, this is definitely still a big theory, or a big, um, a big a popular explanation. And we know that these mergers exist. As you can see over here, here you see more mergers. This is the antenna nebula, or the antenna galaxy, more. And if you then put them all together, these are all different images, you can sort of see the sequence. So you start off with two, they go more together, and here they, they tear each other apart, and then they become sort of one galaxy. So we know this happens. If this is the, really the way to make elliptical galaxies and to make compact elliptical galaxies in particular in the early universe, we don't really know. So the origin of the compact rising galaxies and also the elliptical galaxies in the universe nowadays, and the connection between the two is something that still needs some work. And so there are very good explanations out there. There are different theories out there. But we don't really know exactly what's going on. So how far? Yeah. Sorry to bring up black holes again, but if, <laughs> that is fine. if there are massive stars in the early models of the universe, and if they are collapsing and forming individual black holes, yes. are astronomers working on a, a theory that takes that into account, that the black holes are actually forming the history so you actually and evolution of the galaxy. Yeah. You actually bring up an excellent point because we think that the black holes might actually play a role in making ellipticals. 
because we think that the black holes in the end is sort of making sure that elliptical galaxies become red. Because how do you make a galaxy red? Well, you need to make sure that no new stars are being formed. How do you do that? Well, we think that the black hole, which is going to accrete material around it, is going to have impact on the gas around it and it's going to heat the gas. And the way how you, should form, how you form stars is from cold gas. However, if you have this black hole in the center of a galaxy, and especially a very massive black hole, because the more massive the galaxy, the more massive the black hole, then the black hole could start heating up the gas and could prevent the galaxy from forming new stars. So we do think... Hmm? The bubble blowing. Exactly. Yeah, so we do think that the black holes are really important. But, uh, and we also think that the black holes... So black holes can grow in two ways, on one hand by merging, but also just by accreting and sucking up material around it. But yeah, how exactly these first black holes have formed in the very, very early universe, that's something that people are still working on. Yeah. Okay, so what's, what's our way forward? So what's next? Well, there's lots of different things going on, and I'm excited about lots of different things, but there's one thing, one thing I'm particularly very, very excited about, and that is a new space telescope we're going to get, and this is a James Webb Space Telescope. And I, uh, I have this very cool trailer, and uh, maybe you guys have already seen it, but I think it's really cool. Do we have actually audio? Otherwise, I can put this one next to the audio. There's audio as well. What likelihood is it that it will go up? Or James Webb? Oh, 2018. It will definitely go up, whether it's going to work. Yeah, but we've not been put on the ultimatum. If it's not going to happen in 2018, it's going to be cut. So we have to do it. It's a, I don't know how expensive project. It's super expensive. It's been indeed postponed for many years, but it's been 2018 for a long time. And so John Mather, who uh, is a Nobel Prize winner, uh, who's actually the project scientist of the James Webb, he was at uh, Berkeley the other uh, month, and he was uh, yeah, and he was still very uh, positive that this is actually going to happen. It's a very technically challenging project because this is not going to be a telescope in orbit. It's going to go much further. It's going to go to some stable point, L2, and it's going to be there, and we're never going to get there. People are never going to get there. They may be able to send a robot there, he told us, but people are actually not going to go there. So everything needs to work, and it's going to yes. unfold. And anyway, let's first look at the movie, and then we can oh, talk more be, about it. Be careful, you could get audio feedback from the... <laughs> well, you know, the sound is not that important, but let's see if it works. Star Trek. <laughs> so this is a galaxy simulation. This is actually not what we really see, but how we think it happens. This is one of those merger simulations, collisions. Our system, but it's not going to be orbiting around our Earth. So, 
So, it's, so you saw that it had this super big um, sun shield under it, under the telescope, because it's always going to be protected from the sun, because the sun is actually very damaging for the telescope. And um, yeah, so it's only going to be four more years, and then, uh, <laughs> and so with the James Webb, we can actually look back. We, so I told you a lot about how galaxies look like when the universe was two to four billion years old. At this moment, we can see galaxies that are about 0.5 to 2 billion years old, but they're so fuzzy that we actually don't really know whether they're really at that distance, whether they're really there, exactly what their properties are. So it's all kind of like hand wavy, right? It's very difficult to do that right now. But with the James Webb Space Telescope, Space Telescope, we can really see those first galaxies being formed, those first stars being formed, and we can really see like what the seeds are of the galaxies that we see around us today. So I think it's going to be uh, very exciting and it's very nearby. And actually, I'm at the end of my talk, so that's where I want to end.